Marianne. How you doing? Good, Chrissy. How are you today? I am good. I am excited to talk to Jane Dwinell, our author today, and with her husband, Sky Yardley, they wrote a book called Alzheimer's Canyon, and it's fascinating. Sky did a lot of the writing, a lot of blogs, um, but it is their story of his discovery of his Alzheimer's at a fairly young age and uh, some of the ways in which he experienced Alzheimer's. And, and then Jane added in a lot of parts too about how the effect on her as a caregiver. It's a fascinating read and they're a fascinating couple. Yes, I, I enjoyed the way that they um, their solution to their problem was to share their story and to travel. They traveled all over the United States talking about Alzheimer's and meeting with people with dementia and caregivers and sharing their story. And um, Jane was a universal, a Unitarian Universalist minister. And so that was uh, their audience. They traveled to different churches throughout the the country and did workshops and sky was not uh, shy about sharing his his dilemmas and in his celebrations and his uh, achievements in spite of dementia and he was a pretty funny guy from what we read yeah and um another interesting thing is um he went into memory care right at the start of the pandemic right so she yes. talked all about that and um well, they just did a lot of fascinating things in their life to begin with. Um, mm -hmm. Travel, and he's fluent in French, and they were spent time in France. They retired early to do a lot of um, a lot of philanthropic kinds of work, and were in in uh, uh, New Orleans after Katrina, helping to build houses. I mean, that's just yeah. incredibly fascinating. And so, yeah. and hearing about uh, Sky from Jane. I mean, he just sounds like a fascinating man and um, yeah. with a sense of humor and and with a lot of insight into what was happening for him. Um, but it's 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 a it's funny and it's sad and tender. And I think um, it'll be an interesting conversation. Yes, I think the listeners will really enjoy it. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, let's get to let's it. Let's get started. <laughs> Hi, Jane. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. How are you today? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Hi. I'm so delighted to meet you and really excited to hear what you have to tell us today and tell us about your story. Yeah. So um, your book, Alzheimer's Canyon, was uh, written, started, started with your husband, and he was journaling and blogging about his journey, correct? Right. Yeah. After his um, diagnosis, he he embraced his dementia diagnosis, mm -hmm. unlike many people. And the first thing he did was research. He went to our library and read every book they had about dementia, ordered mm -hmm. many more. <laughs> and he he particularly wanted to read books written by people with dementia, which, as you both know, are few and far between. And he started writing and he was not a writer mm -hmm. he had he had you know he he was a smart guy he'd gone to amherst but he would turned his back on all that academic stuff and in fact when he started writing for the blog he struggled and i'd have to say sky you're not at amherst <laughs> just just write like yes, nobody's right. gonna judge you you know mm -hmm. for your sentence structure um and he just relished writing. He said it helped him make sense of what was going on um, in his life. And he also wanted to do what he could to erase the stigma around dementia, which is why yeah. the writing turned into a blog. And he yeah. just looked forward to writing and looked forward to people's responses. Um, he just completely embraced it. I love that. And I'll, and I'll bet a lot of that was just how to process. You know, sometimes when we write things out, yeah, um, we can make more sense of it ourselves. So what a great strategy, but then what a giving heart to want to share it with yeah. other people to reduce stigma. That's great. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, for, well, first of all, I also wanted to acknowledge you recently uh, won an award for this book in New I England. Know. So it, 
exciting. Yes, the yes. independent publishers of New England named Alzheimer's Canyon the best narrative nonfiction book of 2023. Oh my gosh, fantastic. Wonderful. That is really, what a great accolade after all of this and um, to have that recognition. So congratulations on that. That's really terrific. Absolutely. That's yeah. like the cherry on top, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was completely unexpected. You know, the woman kept email me, emailing me and saying, are you prepared to speak? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and I kept saying to myself, she's only asking me if I, I'm ready to speak, if I'm going to win something. Wow. Yeah, wow. no, it was great. It was a good, nice little ceremony on Zoom. Really cool. Really cool. So what do you think Sky would say about that? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, as a friend of mine, when I posted it on my Facebook, she commented, you know, I forget exactly how she phrased it, but Sky was a very sort of shy, self-effacing man. And he, part of him would be embarrassed by mm. all of all of this and part of him would be delighted but you know he he said that somewhere in one of his writings about that he wasn't known for tooting his own horn which is mm -hmm. true mm -hmm. um, yeah 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 that's interesting that's well that's it's really so, cool yeah can you just go back a little bit and tell us about you know what happened um when did you start noticing that maybe he was having some signs of memory memory impairment or um was he the one who figured it out how did that go what was your journey like getting a diagnosis well you know that was interesting as i suppose it is for most people um my first career was as a nurse and i worked mm -hmm. the two ends of life childbirth and then um hospice and nursing home work and i had worked in a memory care facility when people were first starting to do that, the late eighties, early nineties. So I was familiar with dementia and, you know, Sky was also a very laid back um, guy and forgetful already. Mm -hmm. You know, he was just one of those people that kind of moved through the world at a casual pace. And uh, so actually he first was concerned and this is about four years before his diagnosis. And he went online and found one of those, you know, cognitive tests, which he scored perfectly on. And, you know, he decided to maybe not worry about it. You know, I mean, he was already perfectly healthy, nothing wrong, no family sure. history. Sure. Um, you know, we did all the right exercise, eating, you know, blah, 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 all the, you know, he even created crossword puzzles for our local newspaper. So, you know, he was a smart guy. And it wasn't until a year before his diagnosis that I noticed that he had lost his spatial abilities. And this is a guy, when I met him, he was a produce truck driver. I owned a restaurant and he delivered my produce on Thursday afternoons. And he could back that truck into like anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we had a boat in France and he could do anything with the boat. And then all of a sudden he couldn't. We were actually in mm -hmm. France on the boat and he was having a hard time getting into locks and tying up the boat. And that just seemed weird since he had such good spatial ability. And once we got back to the States, we were meeting our kids um, we had rented a condo in South Carolina for the holidays and we were meeting our kids there. And so we, we were driving in an unfamiliar place, but he kept yelling at me when I was driving, when I was going in the wrong direction. And I was like, this is, you know, this is a guy who had a perfect sense of direction. It was like really weird. And then our daughter um, bought a condo and we were helping her. I was painting and um, she and Sky were, ripping up carpeting and laying hardwood flooring. And I could hear Dana yelling at Sky in the other room, Sky, that's not how you lay flooring. And Sky and I at that point had built six houses. Wow. And we had gone to New Orleans to volunteer after Katrina because we had house building and house renovation skills. And I was like, how could Sky not know how to lay flooring? But mm -hmm. see, it was a real spatial thing. Like he wasn't getting the breaks, you know, how to run the saw and all that kind of stuff. And so that's when we started suggesting maybe there was something wrong and he should get tested. And he avoided that um, like people do. 
he, he didn't really want to think anything was wrong. And it wasn't until we were renovating our new house, uh, we bought a duplex with our son and his partner in Burlington, Vermont. And we were, it, it was a complete gut down to the studs and renovation. And Sky realized he couldn't do the carpentry work. Mm. You know, yeah. that he would, he tried it, he, he would take a measurement, he would have a piece of paper, so he'd write it down, he didn't trust himself to remember, but because he'd lost the spatial ability, he didn't know how to cut a straight line with a circular saw, or how to put the lumber up to have it fit for door trim, you know, and that's when he said, okay, we we got to do something about this, and he agreed to be tested, which was a big mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I don't know what happens in other places, but in Vermont, it was required. And we had just, we'd been in New Orleans, so we'd just moved to Burlington. We didn't have a doctor or anything. But you were required to go to a doctor to have the initial screening and blood tests and blah, blah, blah. And, and then the MRI and then the PET scan. And the University of Vermont Medical Center has a memory clinic and this guy called to make an appointment, and this is when he found out about the doctor thing. And they were like, you know, yeah, this was summer. He said, and they said, well, our next available appointment is in January. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to go nuts. And the woman called back five minutes later and said, somebody has just canceled for next week, oh. which was really lucky. That's so, great. Yeah. you know, with we had a diagnosis within four weeks of his different appointments. Wow. So. But that is a process. But so if first he was reluctant, but then once he, you said, once he received the diagnosis, where did that take him? Um, well, initially into devastation. Yeah. Um, obviously. Yeah. And, and we had coincidentally, completely coincidentally, uh, plan, had a long planned trip to France Mm -hmm. uh, the day after his diagnosis <laughs> mm. it actually was really nice you know it was when we were doing this renovation thing and that's when the sheet rockers were going to come and they said you can't be here for two weeks and we thought oh we can go to France yeah. so you know we spent two weeks walking the streets of Paris and talking and crying and and he he couldn't read a map he couldn't figure out how to use his metro ticket, but his he was fluent in French. His French was impeccable, you know, when we'd go into a store or a restaurant. You know, it's, the brain is such a mysterious thing. Like, That's so <laughs> interesting. Yeah, it's so yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. So in a way, that was a nice break, and it was just the two of us. You know, I mean, our adult kids were obviously processing, you know, he that was the first people he called. Uh, and his sister, you know, stuff. Um, so it, it was a nice break. And that's, by the time we got home, he's like, I'm, I'm ready to roll. Let's do wow. this. Wow. That's. And we, that's... and we ended up the, you know, the next year going on a year long public speaking tour. You know, I was a Unitarian Universalist minister. And so I hooked us up in churches and we spoke at 25 congregations both unitarian universalist and united church of christ we had a living with dementia sermon and mm -hmm. and many of the churches we also held a workshop either on the saturday before the sunday or after church and this guy just loved it he wanted to meet his people he wanted to meet yeah. other people with dementia and by doing this church stuff and the workshops you know it was his people all over the place and in many congregations, there would be somebody who came out who had not told anybody that they had dementia. Right. And became public about it. Yeah. So it's so interesting how different things kind of happen, right? And I I I read that you um you and Sky had retired early and you were doing a lot of these different things. And so it sort of gave you the freedom to be able to um, and 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 really, I just want to say you 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 both are such givers, and you were building things for people, and then going to down to New Orleans. I mean, that's that really touches my heart. I think that's so wonderful. And so, you know, then it, he was what age sixty six when he was formally diagnosed, correct? Right. So yeah, still yeah. 
really young and yeah. um but you had this freedom to be able to process it a little bit differently than maybe someone who has to think about leaving work or <laughs> you oh, know really? changing oh, yeah. everything else um but uh so it's such an interesting way that this kind of evolved for you both yeah oh it was such a gift that we retired early you know we mm -hmm. hadn't really planned on it but it was in the back of our minds and sky professionally was a family mediator and also in vermont did a a thing like mediation called parent coordination but it's not mediation because high conflict families aren't allowed to mediate anyway and he just turned to me one day he said you know i'm really sick of all these people in conflict <laughs> i'd really rather mm -hmm. do something else yeah <laughs> you know he had a very successful practice yeah. but you know he was like you know i'm done yeah you know sure uh, enough of this um get it. <laughs> and, and, sure. and, and coincidentally that it was not long it was like a year like after katrina yeah and you know and we're not city people we're country people and he was like let's go to New Orleans and volunteer. And I thought, oh, sure, why not? You know, we loaded our car with all our carpentry tools right. and an air mattress and off we went. Yeah. And we had a fabulous time. We met such amazing people. We loved the culture of the city and it surprised both of us. Yeah. So you're, you're, you get this diagnosis, you'd go on this, what did you say, a year long venture of looking, going out to different churches and talking and, yep. and sharing things. And, um, and how was, the, how was it for both of you with his disease progression? Were you seeing that progressing along the way? And what, did you know when to, or how did you come to know, well, it's time to come back somewhere and it was Next a step. lovely coincidence. We okay. we did we had the engagements from September to September, and when he got to that last one, I knew he couldn't do it anymore. You know, he was reading his his sermon. You know, mm -hmm. I was reading mine, but mm -hmm. he was mm -hmm. he he was st starting to be scared. Mm -hmm. And luckily, the last one was a local one to us the the last couple of that summer were local because you know we traveled all the way to the west coast um mm. for a lot of it most of it was new england or new jersey and you know what we we hooked it up with the bucket list you know we had done so much traveling he he had one only one thing left on his bucket list which was to go skiing out west mm -hmm. he was a black diamond skier amazing athlete and i'm like okay we'll go. And then I was like, Oh my God, you know, we're in this condo that looks like 300 other condos. <laughs> is is he going to find his way home? Cause you know, I could ski, but you know, there was no keeping up with him. That's for sure. He didn't get lost once. Wow. It was amazing though. He said to me, he said, I learned right away to ride up the chairlift with somebody else and kind of like follow them. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's a brand new mountain. He'd never been. It was really big. You know. Yeah. And, Good strategy. <laughs> yeah, we had a great time. We had a great time. And, you know, his his greatest challenge anywhere we were was where was the bathroom in the middle of the night? Because, of course, that was a different location everywhere we were. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, yeah. yeah, otherwise he did great. Yeah, I find that really, um, that's very an, an interesting because the common um, advice is to not move. And we have one other author in our organization, um, Tony Copeland Parker, who he and his wife were, or his partner, they were marathoners, they ran all over the world, and they're still running now they're in assisted living, but they still occasionally run, but they've been in like almost every country on earth, he just takes her. And she wants to go and they fly and they stay for weeks at a time. And he said, you know, people told me I wasn't doing the right thing, but we were happy. They right. had such made such great memories. So, and I know people who were afraid to travel with their spouse if they have dementia. And there are, it does have its challenges, but it's not impossible. No, mm -hmm. not at all. And and we were, I mean, we were lucky that we had done so much traveling before. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we knew how to travel together. And, you know, I did have to pick up a lot of the travel tasks that he did 
you know, like I had to go get the train tickets or the, you know, play tickets that he had always handled that kind of thing. Um, but that was fine, you know, yeah. and it was, yeah. and it was mostly me. I think I was more worried about it than he was. Sure. Cause I didn't want him to get lost. Like we, right. part of, part of one of the trips was we were in new orleans visiting friends and he said i you know i'm gonna go out for a walk and i'm like oh please come back and he did <laughs> you know and he wasn't yeah. shy about asking for help that's the other thing you know yeah like, that's great right. that's great well, what you're saying makes, I mean, I, I think you speak to a lot of caregivers' anxieties when you say that, right? Sometimes the person who has um, the dementia might be unaware of the anxiety. Many It manifests so differently in everybody, but then there's the caregiver who's like thinking of all the things that could go wrong, right? So that's a lot of, that's a lot on you. Yeah. Right. And I didn't, I wanted him to have his freedom as long as he could. You know, I didn't want to start telling him he couldn't do stuff. Right, right. I mean, there's there's that other challenge then as a caregiver is freedom and then also just dignity. How do we, what do we do while we're watching the person we care about stumble through things and, and um, yeah, make sure that we preserve as much of their dignity as we possibly can, kind of looking at, you know, what, what do we do? So, right. I, I, I was... I mean, I, I was incredibly fortunate that he was the person that he was, that he was willing to talk about stuff. And one of the early conversations we had was about mm -hmm. dropping. Wow. You know, and and when, when would, how would we know it was time for him to stop driving? And it was his choice. He said, this is too mm -hmm. frightening. I am not doing this anymore. Okay. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Because that is yeah, a tough well, conversation. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah. <laughs> Especially since he had been a professional truck driver. I mean, this guy was like into driving. You know, he wrote a beautiful piece about it uh, that's in the book, you know, just remembering the thrill of getting his license as a teenager and realizing like he could go mm -hmm. anywhere. Um, so, you know, and, and he'd always traditionally been the driver when we went on long trips. And partly that he always got car sick. So <laughs> he had to be the driver so he didn't get car sick. Right. Uh, so, anyway. He was very gracious about, you know, letting me drive on long trips. And then once he was, you know, he just t took up driving in town and then came home once and said, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. My stepfather was like that, too. He said to me, um, I don't want to drive. Margie makes me drive. Margie was my mother. So my mother never drove. So it was a problem for her now because then neither of them were driving every once in a while he'd want to drive or he'd say, you know, where's my car? But my brother had disabled it. Mm. So he yeah. couldn't start it. And um, we would say to him, Oh, it's okay. And then, then when he was in the nursing home, we would tell him, Oh, it, it's at home. It's at home. It's okay. No one's using yeah. it. It's at home. It's waiting for you. You know, and he would be satisfied with that. But I was so relieved when he <laughs> didn't want to drive anymore. I was waiting for a huge eruption. It is so nice when it's their choice, <laughs> but yeah. then there are those other ways around it. Um, yeah. Jane, I wanted to also um, then talk about what came next. It, um, I, you had um, had at some point needed to um, put Sky or chose Sky chose, or you guys decided for him to go into care, a care facility, and then. Um, you know, and then, wow, everything changed, right? Then we, <laughs> we entered a whole new world. So right. for all of us. So maybe um, you could talk a little bit about how that decision came about that you, between the two of you, for him to take some time into a facility. Well, it, part of his early research mm -hmm. about dementia was visiting our local memory care facility and having a tour and finding out the outrageous amount of money that it cost. He was very frugal and he was like, oh my God, but I knew what it cost. And I'd started saving money as soon I opened a special savings account um, to start saving money in case that day came. But I thought, oh, I, you know, I'm the nurse. I can handle this. You know, we're going to do this to the end. I'm not afraid of diapers and like, whatever. Well, what happened was he, 
we didn't know he had Lewy body dementia until after he died and had a autopsy, but he started hallucinating all the time, 24 hours a day. Um, and his hallucinations were benign. I mean, actually a lot of them were amazing. You know, I, I loved, he was, the trees had names. He was talking to trees. There were elves that lived on the roof and, you know, I mean, it was pretty incredible, but you know, he'd wake me up in the middle of the night to tell me about this. Yeah. I wouldn't go back to sleep and he'd go right back to sleep. And I was getting exhausted. My whole body broke out in hives. Oh my God. I was a complete wreck. Mm -hmm. Itchy, itchy, itchy. And um, I had been able to go away some like a, a weekend now and then. And you know, we were in this duplex with our son and his partner. And so they would look after Sky. And I finally said, you know, I think I've, I can't do this anymore. And my son, and we also had a daughter who lived near, you know, like an hour away. And so the three of us talked about it, me and the two kids about whether Sky sh should go to a memory care facility. Well, our local facility offered a respite program uh -huh. where you could stay for two weeks to two months. And, you know, that seemed like a good idea. So Sky and I went on a tour and he loved it. His people were there. <laughs> His people were yeah. there. Yeah. You know? And we had also had a, a break in a couple of months before two three months before and you know i think that scared him i think he he realized he would feel safe at the memory care facility and my kid my son was still kind of against this because he was in the like we can take care of sky thing and he told me to go away for three days to our camp which is where i am now um and he would take care of sky and we could all think about it and I, I got back and he said, I didn't realize that taking care of Sky would mean that I wouldn't get to sleep. Oh. And that was, I said, yep, this is what we've been doing. And he was like, okay, let's do this. Two weeks. And I had visions of tropical beaches and tropical drinks and reading novels. <laughs> and, sleeping. and, you know, after two weeks, I'd be revived and We'd, it'd be fine. I'd take care of Scott. And I placed him on March 10th, 2020. And the next week was the lockdown. Wow. <laughs> and I didn't get to see him for five months. So you were, he was there in a re on respite. Right. And you couldn't, you couldn't you take him out that. from respite. Wow. Take him out. If I took him out, he was not going to be allowed to go back in. Right. And he had, the the they had, the facility had their own doctor and she was fabulous the staff was fabulous and he was up all night with hallucinations and he was peeing wherever he felt like peeing and sleeping wherever he felt like sleeping and they tried all kinds of medications to help him sleep with no luck and that's when i realized after the two months when i would theoretically have to take him out i'm like he's he's staying with you until this is all over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's just, um, that's had to be so hard to start to, you know, first of all, that shock of, I, oh, I can't get him back. <laughs> right, no, I couldn't, you know, <laughs> then, take him out for a drive or, and when we had visited, one of the things that I really liked was watching uh, the family members you know, they were coming yes. in to feed people lunch or walk with them or whatever. And I was, you know, I mean, they said for respite, don't come. You know, it's harder for everybody. Just go away for the two weeks and then come back. But then I realized with the lockdown, the staff lost all those family members, you know, yes. who helping. And they had to do it all themselves. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about 
because you couldn't go into the facility, how did you make contact? How did you find out how he was doing? What, what you know, we saw pictures throughout the pandemic of people going up to windows and saying hello, or and I know there was Zoom, but Zoom's hard when you have dementia, right? I mean, and then exactly. and are the staff around to do it? So can you talk to us a little yeah. bit about what you did? Well, you know, of course, all of us were in this like what's happening in the world thing. You know, the whole place was a mess, and and Sarah and Emma and I, with the lockdown, decided to move to camp because we thought if if we can't go anywhere. We might as well be on the lake and it's beautiful. And by then it's going to be spring. And, you know, so the three of us abandoned our duplex in Burlington and moved to camp. And of course, then all of a sudden I'm living with my adult child and his partner. So that's like a new thing too. And Sky would call, you know, I, I would call sometimes, but, you know, in his hallucinatory world, sometimes he was too busy to talk to me. Yeah. So what I said to the staff was just have him call me when he wants to call me. And, you know, we, we talked on the phone at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. And he, he called in whatever current hallucination he was in and he was usually traveling and he wanted to tell me where he was and what he was doing and when he'd be home. And, you know, it was, I played along with it and sometimes he'd talk to me for a minute and sometimes he'd talk to me for 20 minutes. Like I didn't ever know. And he never once asked to come home. Never. Wow. Which is, okay. Thank God for that. That would have just like, you know, mm -hmm. I had a friend whose husband went into care about the same time. And every time she saw, it was one of those where she could come to the window thing thing. Mm -hmm. I was an hour away. So, uh, you know, I wasn't going to do that. He every time he asked, well, why, why am I here? Why can't I go home? Anyway, that was a blessing. After five months, uh, the governor lifted the ban on people going to senior facilities and they allowed um, a visit for a half an hour once a week outside, six feet apart, masked and gowned. Mm -hmm. and try that with somebody with dementia and see how that goes. Wow. Not great. And at that point, Sky physically couldn't hold his head up anymore. So he couldn't even see me. Yeah. Like he could hear me, but he couldn't see me. And even if I sat on the ground, you know, the staff was right there. They were keeping the six foot apart thing. They were being strict about it. Um, and even if I sat on the ground, he still couldn't see me. And every, I, every week I'd say, am I going to do this again? Because sure. it was really painful. It was really, really painful. Yeah. And then I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it again. And then by fall, it was another lockdown. Oh, yeah. Just oh. revolving lockdowns, right? Yeah. Revolving lockdowns. And it wasn't until hit the last week of his life that, you know, they, they, they were good about having, you know, like a Zoom thing for family members. And I, I forget how, I think it was only once a month. I don't think it was once a week. And they, we were on this Zoom call and they mentioned it's that people were allowed compassionate care visits, you know, if their person was dying or not doing well. And Sky had, um, it wasn't that he had fallen, but he, the doctor had called me and said he couldn't bear weight that he would try to stand and collapse. And she was afraid he had broken his hip. He was a very slender mm -hmm. guy and, you know, had x-rays done, no broken hip. Cause I was like, Oh man, broken hip. Like, right. <laughs> my mother had a broken hip and I had to deal with that. And she didn't yeah. even have dementia. Um, anyway, the, the doctor said to me an interesting thing. She said, sometimes people with dementia, lose their ability to understand where they are in space, mm -hmm. which certainly made sense with Sky's spatial awareness mm -hmm. issue and that that's why he couldn't stand. Yeah. So they allowed me a compassionate care visit. And within two days, he couldn't swallow. And three days after that, he was dead. Oh, <laughs> but my. I was allowed to be there the last three days. Wow. And they were great. They brought in a cot. They brought me meals. The staff members came in and told stories. They sure. loved him. They completely loved him. And he was so happy there. He was yeah. so happy there. 
that that's what made it okay. Yeah. Yeah. How long was it since, you know, the time of his um, diagnosis till he passed? Four and a half years. Mm, it's quick. And he was in the facility for almost a year, just shy of a year. So mm. just a little over 70, right? I mean, he was yes. young. He was young. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. though the doctor, the neurologist said, no, you have to be under 60 for it to be young. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, he, he had it before, three years before Probably, that, right? yeah. Exactly. So yeah. d- did he have any disorientation with like the masking and did he know it was you when you were there by he your voice? Me, he knew me till the end. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Which is amazing yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, when, I, when I went for the compassionate care visit, he was in a wheelchair and he was, you know, pretty out of it. And then I forget, you know, like I was talking to him because I was like, my God, I'm finally in his physical presence. I'm touching him, you know, whatever. And he kind of came to and I don't know what I had said. And he looked at me and he said, Jane, you always think you're right. And I'm like, yep, he still knows who I am. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) And the last thing he said to me, he told me I was beautiful. Oh, Jane, that's lovely. So you mentioned that um, there was an autopsy. Was that a, that was at your request? Yes. And yeah, then, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I don't think we've talked about that before on the podcast. Yeah, that, I had that question also. Is that common or not common? Or um, well, the doctor, this fabulous doctor, you know, approached me and said, "Would you like to do an autopsy?" And I said, "Absolutely." I mean, let's find out. Like. Because I knew you didn't get a definitive diagnosis until autopsy. And then I was also curious, how how was the rest of him, you know, <laughs> given that he was 70 and what I had assumed was an otherwise perfect health. And by God, he was an otherwise perfect health. Mm-hmm. Um, and they found both Lewy body and Alzheimer's equally extensively in his brain, which is highly unusual. Wow. Yeah. Wow. There was no family history, you said. No family history. But interestingly, his both his parents had neurological diseases. His mm-hmm. father had MS and his mother had narcolepsy and his sister has mm-hmm. MS. So I, it just made me think that the family had a neurological weakness gene somehow that was sure. manifesting itself differently. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, that's... Um... I mean, that's fascinating. It's fascinating to know that then to have that information and, 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 and maybe it puts some pieces together, like you said, the hallucinations and how that, because it's very hard to diagnose the Lewy bodies. Um, and, yeah. The, the yeah. last time we visited the neurologist yeah. at the memory clinic, I brought up the hallucinations. I said, you know, uh-huh. so he's having hallucinations, you know, what do you think about that? And the doctor said, well, or th- do they bother him? And I said, well, no. And the doctor said, don't worry about it. And he didn't even put it in his notes. <laughs> Interesting. And it was the first thing that the facility doctor said to me. She said, I think he's got Louis body. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she yeah. was great. Yeah, because I think that is a hallmark of Louis body. Yeah. And a lot of times yeah. people have horrifying, horrifying hallucinations, real scary stuff. Exactly. Yeah, he, he had mm-hmm. he had those now and then like war kind of thing, because they you know as you know when somebody's in a facility they have to call if the person falls, mm-hmm. and it wasn't this guy was falling but he liked to spend a lot of time on the floor, <laughs> so they had to call me, <laughs> and and that was when he'd have the war hallucinations he was like crawling on the floor trying to avoid bullets and stuff but that didn't happen very often usually it was he was traveling or. And then there would be times when the the handyman and him came out and they'd find him on his hands and knees in somebody's bathroom and he was saying he was trying to fix the toilet. <laughs> you know, so. Well, he was always trying to help. That's really great. Well, and actually, after he died and I visited, uh, you know, I did a book thing with the staff, they told me he did this amazing thing. Well, first of all, his professional mediation skills were still there. He was mediating conflicts with the residents. <laughs> and But the other thing he did is that if he felt 
um, he could, he really had a great empathy for people. If he felt a staff member was getting stressed out about something, he would walk up to them and stand next to them and turn to them and touch them lightly and say, are you okay? Can I help you? Mm, wow. And they were like, whoa, snapped them right out of whatever was going on. They felt they learned a lot from him. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. I mean, it's interesting how the core of who we might be is going to show up in different ways, despite, um, you know, whatever is coming our way, right? Right. And this is a man who, you know, had lost all his bodily functions. You know, he was in diapers and had to be fed and sure. all that other stuff. I mean, he was still writing almost up to a year before his death when he, he was still at home. And he was unable to dress himself and bathe himself. He was still writing. Yeah. You know, it might take him two days to write four paragraphs, but he was still writing. Yeah. Yeah. I find that very interesting because we do have several authors in our organization who do have dementia and have written books and some have written more than one and some have traveled, uh, you know, quite extensively promoting their books and doing talks and stuff and, People have accused them of faking that they have dementia mm -hmm. because they can't understand how you can you have dementia and write beautifully or speak mm -hmm. beautifully. Wow. Right. No, it always amazes mm -hmm. me. Yeah. But you don't you lose that, especially people that have done it all their lives, you know. Right. And Sky hadn't, but he, like I say, he mm -hmm. was, you know, he was he'd had perfect scores on his SATs. You know, he was just right. Brilliant. Was and he and he said to me in one phone call. He said, you know, they call me the professor here. <laughs> I'm like, you know, which hallucination is this? Well, he did. they called him the professor because, you know, as he, as he said to me, he said, you know, when we play those trivia games or those geography games, I have to keep my mouth shut because I know all the answers. And it was true. <laughs> and he, I mean, we were playing, we were a big board and card game family and we played until Sky really couldn't. And it, the final game that we could play was Trivial Pursuit because it didn't involve pieces and boards and counting. And, you know, we sure. would just ask questions and people would answer them. And he, he would always win. <laughs> you know, That's, right. That's fascinating. How the brain. We, we know so little about the brain. Yeah, completely. Yeah. How, uh, how, frozen. um, I'm frozen? frozen on me. Hmm. I, I, Marianne I, looks frozen to me. Yeah. Yeah. I have you frozen. Oops. Yeah. You guys, I, I think I froze because you guys were frozen on my screen. Yeah. Now I have an unstable connection. What else is new? Are you, no, I was saying, are you back? We, we know <laughs> yeah. so, we know so little about the brain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we yeah. know so much more about heart and, and other organs, sex right. organs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the brain, we don't. And, and, and there's just so many amazing things that people who have dementia can do. A lot of people um, discover that they can paint and draw and do yes. work like that. And yes. they've never done it before. And they um, produce outstanding stuff. It's yeah. Incredible. Now, we went to a couple of conferences uh, with the Dementia Action Alliance. And there were art exhibits at both of them. And the stuff was amazing. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. the people had only taken it up after their diagnosis. Yeah. I did want to ask how how did how was it for your two adult children nearing the end? Were they did they have time with him? Were they able to um, see him at all when he was in the facility? Um, yes, um, they they were able to come during those last three days. Um, unfortunately, every time my son came, this guy was unconscious. Oh. Um, but our daughter was able. It was one of the times that he, it was actually the last time he was conscious mm -hmm. when she was there. And Sky loved to sing. He was one of those people that had a song lyric for every occasion. Mm -hmm. And he was really big in changing lyrics. He said his father did this. And he and our daughter particularly did this together. They were long distance hikers together. They had done the long trail in Vermont. And so they were singing, you know, and wow. he was so weak, he could hardly speak. Mm -hmm. And they're just singing along, which was perfect, you yeah. know, for her. And sure. then she came after he died. Um, and, you know, we sat with him for several hours and talked and then packed up his 
stuff and yeah you had to bring all your own furniture to this memory care facility oh, wow okay you know, we had to we had a lot of packing to do and we which moved. is I say, oh, wow. But on the other hand, it's like, mm, that's actually could be very comforting, right? Something very familiar and, and very. Right. And know, was it? Who knows? Who, you know, yeah, exactly. Not like who a knows? hospital setting. Right. Right. Yeah. Sometimes these places are more for the family than for the residents, you know? Yeah. How, how do your um, children feel about your book and your notoriety now and your um, <laughs> award winning um, place in, in all of this? Well, the really fun part about that um, is that our daughter is a graphic designer and she designed the book. Oh, gorgeous. Oh, yeah. And she, well, she's my technical expert. So she, she set up the blog and taught me how to like do all oh. that. And her, I, I, this is actually my fourth book. I'm the writer in the family. <laughs> and the, the first one was with a major publisher, the two in the middle, I self-published and Dana, our daughter did the graphic design and her best friend, Marisa is a professional editor. And she had edited those two books. Well, she had just gotten hired by my publisher for Alzheimer's Canyon. So she edited Alzheimer's Canyon as well. So it was a real pleasure to be able to work with Dana and Marisa um, yeah. on the book. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. That is amazing. And our son, he's not, you know, it's, any of this is not interesting to him, but he's, he he embraced taking care of Skye, you yeah. know, as an, a, a young adult male. Yeah. You know, I think was a really big deal. We were a very close family. We homeschooled. Uh -huh. And so the four of us really spent a lot of time together more yeah. than most families yeah yeah and we were able we'd always talked openly about everything and I think it helped that I was a minister and a nurse and you know like the kids were at their grandparents death like talking about death was a, like a regular thing like talking about sex you know we yeah, talked about yeah. all of it it's so yeah they they handled this very well yeah and they both said <laughs> they both said it's way better that Sky got dementia than you Oh my. <laughs> well, it's because Sky was a very laid back, kind of quiet guy, right. and I'm not. <laughs> Got it. Um, and where did the title Alzheimer's Canyon come from? That came from Sky's Fantasy World. Um, mm -hmm. In the book, there are 11 episodes about uh, this guy who finds himself in Alzheimer's Canyon, one way in and no way out. Mm -hmm. uh, the detour off the highway that nobody asked to take. And so he wrote this fantasy story with this guy who ends up in Alzheimer's Canyon, who has many wild and crazy adventures. So Got it. That's wonderful. That's where it came from. Yeah. And, and reading them, you know, after all was said and done, it's really like what happened. Yeah. 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 Very huh. good. So how did it come about that you actually finished the book and and got it published where, where was he where did he leave it off um he i had written some mm -hmm. um you know just sort of you know this is what it's like for the partner kind of stuff but you know maybe once a year once or twice a year maybe um but once he was unable to write i took up writing and i wrote like once a month you know, because our blog crowd, you know, they wanted to know what was happening. So, oh. um, and it was after he died, I, I thought this deserves to be a book. This deserves to go out into the larger world. And I didn't, I didn't want to self-publish again. My two self-published books were very, for a very niche market, um, it, you know, and they did well, the thousand copies, you know, for their little thing. You know, this is big. This is like everybody you know, 6 million people or more with dementia in the U.S. So, so I put, I, you know, I organized the blog posts and I wrote introductions to each year. And then I looked for a publisher and found one. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. That's amazing. Did you want to read us something from the book? Yeah. I'd love to that? hear if you're Did ready. You oh, we'd um, love it. Ah. <laughs> How much time do we have? your time yeah well here's a here's a couple of little short ones 
that are kind of cute, funny. Excellent. Um, they're called Store One and Store Two. Store One. Alzheimer's, you are so slow. I can run circles around you if I want to. To prove it, I just drew a clock. It took 19 seconds, and it wasn't a bit difficult. Unlike at the store yesterday, $6.41. First, I hand over a five and a one. I'd brought some change from home, so I dump a few coins on the counter. Quarters, nickels, dimes, and two pennies. Uh-oh. My mind gets seriously busy, jangling. Way too many possibilities. Most of them skyrocketing over 41 cents. Others, not enough. The store clerk is patient, watching me pushing the coins around and around and around. Store two. The Vermont State Liquor Store is a busy place this Friday afternoon in May. The colleges are winding down, the students are winding up, and the one liquor store in town is shaking. Twenty-somethings dominate the store, both behind the counter and in the long, polite lines of customers waiting to check out. The store is prepared for the onslaught with extra help at the checkouts. But there's one old guy, two or three times the age of everybody else. He's kind of disheveled, wearing work clothes. Despite his small purchase, he manages to hold up the line, emptying one of his pockets onto the counter. Why? Now the old guy is randomly sliding his pocket full of change across the counter at the clerk and muttering something. Homeless, maybe. Drunk. Possibly. Or could have escaped from his nursing home. Nope. Just me in another cameo appearance as the demented one. <laughs> My goodness. I love that he had, had such had a sense of humor. Yes, yeah, sense of humor. I love that he had such a sense right. of humor. And he was not... Um... Oh, what's the word? He he was he had self awareness, but he was not. He could laugh at himself, right? You know, and and yeah. he wasn't a, didn't wasn't afraid to make himself look foolish, right? Hmm. As people who have read the book says, you will laugh and you will cry. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, right. Because it's also very poignant as well, and he gets a lot across in a very short, um, short yeah. period yeah. of writing. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So Jane, what's next for you? What's next for me? That's a very interesting question. What's next for me is that I'm moving to France. Oh my, okay. <laughs> it was wow. Scott and I always wanted to. We had this canal boat in France for 10 years and we had, we had thought about moving to France yeah. and we had actually looked for property and hadn't found anything in particular. And um, two years ago, I went to France to scatter some of his ashes in places that had been meaningful to us. And I said to myself, oh, my God, you could move to France. <laughs> it's just you. Like, your kids are grown up. They're responsible. They're fine. Like, I could move to France. And actually, I just got back from two weeks in France, and I bought a piece of property. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. How wonderful. What a great next That's chapter. Fantastic. Yeah. And unfortunately, he was the one who was fluent and not me. I, I don't have the language gift that Sky had. So I am struggling with my French, but I can yeah. get on sort of. And they like you to speak French in France. <laughs> yep. too. And those waiters in Paris, they'll start speaking English as soon as I open my mouth. But yeah. I'm a small city in the southwest of France where they're much nicer. Yes, yes, yes. So you'll have to let us know when you arrive so that we can change your status and we can say we have an author in France. <laughs> That's you right. You'll be the right. first French author. Or yeah, author. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Will you continue anything in terms of um, uh, advocating around Alzheimer's or dementia? Or is that something that you want to maybe put on a shelf and pursue some other kinds of avenues i mean because jane yeah. it sounds to me like you're into everything so this is like you could go in a lot of directions i could i could um well i spent the last year um from when the book was published in november of 2022 uh, through may um yeah. public yeah. speaking around the country yeah. about book, bookstores libraries churches and i got appointed to the vermont commission on alzheimer's and other related disorders mm-hmm 
and I did a lot of advocating at the state house and gave the prayer one day and you know whatever and it's time to for me yeah you know yeah it's time for me and and it was it was wonderful to do that and then also like every week I get to talk about my husband dying hey is this a lot of fun <laughs> Well, there is that, right? So, gosh, I think moving to France sounds like a really wonderful um, segue yeah. in your life. Yeah. yeah. So at this point, I'm not seeking out any public engagements, but if people mm -hmm. approach me, I do them. And interestingly, a guy from Sky's class at Amherst, I had an audio book made and he listened to the audio book and he contacted me. He said, our class meets on Zoom once a month. Will you come and speak to our class? Aww. I'm going to do that next month. So that ought to be interesting. Yeah, yeah. They were like, we don't ever talk about death. We should talk about death. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> we're all like 73. <laughs> yes, you should talk about death. <laughs> That's what I'm always telling people. You you need to start talking to your parents and know what they want. And you need to talk about And you need to know what your plan is. You're like, don't wait till the last minute. <laughs> but it's hard. It's hard for people. So no, you know. I, know. I spent years being a in a little hospital and there was more than once I'd be in that emergency room with somebody who was dead or dying and families are like, what do we do? Right, right, right. Well, I, I think that sounds really exciting and and um and and also very soul satisfying to go and do something fun right. and adventurous. And and right. hey, you're really frightening. <laughs> And and your kids get to come to a cool place, you know? They've got a place in France to visit. There you go. Sounds terrific. Yeah. Where can people find you um, on the internet, social media? Um, I have a website, janevoyant.com. Uh, and my other books are available there. And other, mm -hmm. we lived in a tiny house for two years. And there's a blog about the tiny house. Anyway, yes, mm -hmm. we did all kinds of stuff. And I'm on Facebook and Instagram, um, Jane Dwayne on Facebook and Jane for Care on Instagram. I just followed you, Jane. So that's really exciting. Okay. I'm glad that you're on social and that's great that people can find you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And where can people buy your book? Other they than your website. They can buy it um, at their favorite independent bookstore. Mm -hmm. They can buy it from Amazon. They can buy it from me. Wherever they'd like to, they can ask their library to get a copy. Yes. That's right. That's right. That everybody can read it. Yes. Yeah, right. And they can get it on uh, through, at this point, through the Alzheimer, or I'm sorry, through the Alz Authors um, website, too. Great. So that's terrific. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to tell our listeners before we say goodbye? No, I think that we covered a lot now, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. An hour goes a long way. We did. Yeah, it does. Now I'm right. going to have to go do my French lesson. Come on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> au revoir. Well, yeah. <laughs> au revoir. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And really, I learned so much. And it was great to talk with you. And, and what a beautiful book. I look forward to uh, reading it myself. So it's great. Thank you so much. Well, thanks Thank for having you, me. That was fun. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia, a podcast produced by alzauthors.com, a community dedicated to supporting caregivers and people with dementia through heartfelt personal stories. Please hit the subscribe button and like buttons, and we'd love to hear your comments. To learn more about Al's Authors, be sure to go to alzauthors.com and subscribe to our newsletter so you can be among the first to know everything happening at Al's Authors. You can also follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, where we share a wealth of resources for the dementia journey. Remember, you are not alone. One can sing a lonely song, but we chose to form a choir and create harmony. See you soon. <laughs>